Alrighty then. What a fun time this has been. Les six jours de glory. Interesting, 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 interesting. Uh, here's the deal. I, I think there has to be some consideration given to this game <clears throat> from the perspective that, first of all, it is an older game. Uh, secondly, uh, it is the first game in a new series. And it, uh, and because of that, it certainly suffers from perhaps a, I don't know when it was actually published. Let's quickly see if we can find that date here. Uh, I want to say either 87 or 97. I'm not sure if I can have this here on the back here somewhere. 97. So what are we talking about? Uh, it's old. <laughs> That's old. So maybe playtesting back then was done differently. Maybe there was a little less uh, robustness applied to this. Nevertheless, here's what I've managed to ascertain because I haven't given up on this. I actually I like where this system is today. Uh, you know the uh, Seven Days of Glory or Six Days of Glory, uh, the other battles that I've played before, Jenna and a few others, they're, they're pretty good games. And the new iterations of the rules are fairly straightforward. You know, there is some level of abstraction that, that occurs within the game system per se because, you know, you're moving divisions and brigades and some cavalry and stuff around. Uh... Napoleonic tactics don't come into it, but what does come into it is the the newness. Uh, well, by 1814, here in this game, everybody was, you know, starting to copy uh, the formation structures and the core concepts and the the maneuver elements uh, that Napoleon innovated with back in the you know early 1800s, 1806 or whatever the case may be. You know, five, and and so that everything became uh, more uh, equivalent from a from a tactical and maneuver standpoint, but also weapons. I think you know the weapon capabilities certainly all were upgraded a little bit by that time as well, perhaps. So uh, training was also different as well, and improved by by the coalition forces, whatever they may be at that time. So. <clears throat> What is cool about this system is this maneuver concept, this operational art of war aspect where we're put in a situation immediately, uh, what does Napoleon do? Does he chase after the forces over here that are exiting the map? Or does he come and hit these uh, a few uh, uh, Russian, are these Russian or Prussian, I forget. Uh, Prussian uh, forces and try and knock them out of the game, pick up some VPs, uh, then try and block, uh, you know, block some roads here to prevent exits and things like that. Or, or what do they, what do they do? So I, I went back into, uh, you know, the, I don't know if you can see it, but I went back into the campaigns of Napoleon and I, and I started looking through some of the um, Le Patrie and Danger chapters right near the end here where it looked at all these different battles that occurred around Brienne which is uh, there's Benet, where's Brienne oh, it's around here somewhere dang it I had it just before no, I can't find it but Vauchamps is in here uh, so it, it really helped me understand a little bit more about the maneuver aspects of the, of the game. And I know there's good designer notes in here, but it's always better to kind of grab a book and have a look at it. Had a look at this guy as well. That kind of helped me get a little bit of a, a handle on some other concepts that were going on in here in this book. And what I was able to reconcile once I found some errata and uh, some inferred rules in a review is that... Uh, <clears throat> Here's how this, I think, should work. The French have, uh, I believe, 23 units, uh, plus or minus one for the baggage. Um, coalition have uh, 31 units. And 
The idea here is, in the campaign game, the VPs awarded for exit may not exceed the, co- exceed the coalition total VPs gained for killing units. So, uh, that's rule 21.8, and I'm just going to make sure this is not actually in here, and I just missed it because I found this online. Uh, could be really sad if that was actually in here and I missed it. Yeah, it's not in it's, Yeah, I'm not seeing it in here. Yeah, it's not listed in the rule. In fact, 21.8 is a very long rule. So, and then the demoralization, demoralization levels uh, have to play into this as well. So, so you get half a, half a VP for every unit destroyed. You get half a VP for every unit exit, inc- exited, including the bridge and the, uh, the a baggage train. And uh, that, so you've got to weigh up how, how are you going to handle it from that perspective. Given that at the outset of the game, these guys have, I think they have a night march to start with. So they can't get into a zone of control. And then they're going to roll right into a new turn. And they're going to get their AM and their PM turns. So do they go this way and try and jump on the stationary Russian forces? Or do they jump on the stationary uh, Prussian forces? The because we've got this this little boundary here, that white counter and that white counter there, gives us a boundary where as long as we stay in those those boundaries, we don't auto activate e- either of these two of these two forces. There is a die roll that allows these guys to activate, but clearly, if we got you know, if we you know got into some combat here and maybe got into uh, this town here, Mon Mon Miral here, we could maybe then lunge over here and start trying to pick off some of these units before they get a chance to do too much. I don't know. Uh, the easier easier option potentially is jump on here, kill these units rapidly if possible and then look to hold some sort of position around this area to prevent... I'm going to bring this over here now. Let's zoom in here. We want to prevent these guys from coming down here, up here, and exiting the board. So we want to get into some, some location around here that will block exit through here. Now, all of these forces could potentially exit the map pick up some VPs, but once again, we've got that condition now that says, hey, you cannot uh, earn more exit VPs than uh, VPs you accumulate for killing units. And so, you know, there's a balance there that the coalition is gonna have to play against. And there's also a uh, consideration around, I read in a review or a commentary somewhere that (coughs) either the French or the coalition, one of the two forces, and I think it's the coalition, they have to initiate some form of combat before they're allowed to begin exiting. And I didn't say which force, where the force had to be, or anything like that. It just was inferred or stated and then inferred that that's what the rule was. I have not found that errata anywhere. I don't know if it's accurate or not. But uh, given the rest of the writing that this chap had, uh, had done on the gameplay uh, being fairly significant, actually, uh, he did a very nice write-up of a, game, of a scenario, uh, wrote an AAR for it, and then also uh, Rob Lindsay was his name. I don't even know if he's around anymore. Uh, but he, uh, he wrote up a nice uh, overview of the game and uh, the historical movements of the forces, which I might be happy to uh, recount for you on the map and use a you know chalk pencil or something to share that with you if that's something that's of interest. All right, I just want to share with you that you know we haven't given up here. Uh, I'm getting ready to start this thing. Now that I've worked out the victory conditions, because that's one of the very first things I like to do when I look at a game is understand how, how, how do, do both sides achieve some level of victory what happened historically, and then how do the game mechanics and the rules allow us to 
you know, engage with that set of circumstances. So thought I'd share that with you. Uh, the six days of glory will will begin anon, uh, or not, as the case may be. But now we'll we'll get after it pretty quickly. I'll look forward to talking to you soon, guys. Ciao.